morning good afternoon and good evening uh, all iscf welcomes you to the deep dive workshop on sustainable air conditioning with district cooling systems at acef 2021 This is a quick overview of today's workshop. We will have the welcome uh, address and introduction to the workshop by Mr. Reggie Kumar Pillai, President ISGF and Chairman GSCF. Session one is experiences with DCS projects by Mr. Rajiv Sharma from Gir City and Mr. Parmeet Gupta from Tabriz. The second session is the panel discussion on pol on policy regulations and implementation challenges in DCS with our panelists, Mr. Rahul Agnihotri from UNEP, Mr. Arijit Singh. Gupta from Bureau of Energy Efficiency, Mr. Girja Shankar from ESL, and Mr. Marcus Viper from GIZ. And the session is moderated by Mr. Michael Ekupson, Executive Director, APUEA. I would now like to request Mr. Reggie Kumar Pillai, President, ISCF, and Chairman, GSCF, for the introduction to the workshop. good morning good afternoon good evening to all the participants from around the world and also the eminent panelists who have agreed to join this uh, important workshop on district cooling systems let me start by thanking asian development bank for giving us this opportunity to conduct this deep dive workshop on the sidelines of asia clean energy forum cooling challenge is emerging as the biggest challenge in front of humanity uh, most of the countries have signed up for the kigali action uh, plan however uh, in the last couple of years the focus been on incremental improvement in efficiency of the cooling equipment room air conditioners and other uh, equipment used in the cooling systems uh, today in india less than 10% of the people have access to cooling only in some cities prosperous cities like delhi and other north indian cities where the temperature are too high about 25 to 30 percent people have access to cooling with economic prosperity and rising temperature the the cooling the air air conditioner stock increases by millions every year the incremental efficiency in the equipment is not going to meet the desired purpose of uh, eliminating the refrigerant gases nor reducing the emission and the uh, temperature rise in the last three decades in delhi the temperature the maximum summer temperature has gone up by 6 degrees from 42 degrees centigrade in the 80s and 90s today it has gone to 48 degree plus and by all indications by end of this decade the summer maximum temperature in north india will be above 50 degree centigrade making it impossible for common man to live work even commute we need to look at radically different solutions for offering uh, cooling uh, for couple of hours of sleeping and workspace with uh, you know adequate cooling for people to do and perform uh, the incremental improvement of the room air conditioner is not going to be the solution and as more and more people are able to afford room air conditioners and fit, fitting it on every window the heat emitted from this room air conditioners create heat islands which makes many areas commercial areas and residential areas in a town or a city several degrees centigrade above the ambient temperature we need to find solutions uh, the people the poor who and the weaker sections of the society who cannot today afford cooling and their life is going to be miserable and we need to find solutions to give them uh, cooling solutions at affordable cost district cooling system is one such technology or solution which is been there for almost uh, 70 80 years but somehow it has not taken off in a big way only in some areas like middle east and couple of other regions in the last two decades district cooling systems have shown a uh, increase in, 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 increased adoption and in india we have only one dcs plant built 7 years ago in gift city gujarat uh, industrial and fine tech city in uh, uh, gandhinagar between ahmedabad and gandhinagar so there is a well functioning district cooling system there and later you will find a presentation from mr rajiv sharma on that project and how it is advantageous uh, 
in brief how a district cooling system work in a centralized chiller plant you make chilled water which is at 5 degree centigrade and that 5 degree centigrade chilled water is circulated to different buildings in the vicinity through insulated pipes and at the entrance of the each building there will be a heat transfer plate from which uh, the, the chillness of the chilled water which is going at 5 degree is transferred to the air handling system of the building and chilled uh, the uh, uh, air is passed through the air handling system where this chilled water is circulating and it gives a 20 degree, 22 degree, 24 degree uh, air inside the building, keep it uh, uh, cool. So there is no sub separate centralized air conditioning required in each building, only air handling unit is required, which means only about 10 to 15% of the electricity consumption for cooling is required in each of those buildings. And when uh, the cooling load of all the building is aggregated into one chiller plant, again, huge uh, operational efficiency you need less than 50 percent of the combined cooling load of each of the building when you build a centralized structural plant so this is the in in brief how a district cooling system work we will be giving electricity water uh, gas etc through pipes and wires to each building uh, as a some service against a monthly fee we should be able to give cooling also as a service against a monthly fee to each building which will reduce the capex of each building as well as make the life easy for the citizens. So, and as a as as, as a uh, society, we, we have a responsibility to give uh, cooling to low-income communities, and with DCS, we will be able to do that. And business models need to be uh, uh, sustainable. Uh, business models need to be uh, looked at for offering uh, cooling as a service to all the new buildings. I, I, it can be done. There are many studies which has been done in the recent past. Uh, it can be done in brownfield projects as well as in new projects. All the smart cities and all new commercial and residential communities or, or complexes which will be built in the coming years should be mandated to have district cooling system rather than having individual uh, uh, centralized air conditioning or window air conditioners. Another advantage why India Smart Grid Forum looking at this area is because of the, the thermal storage which DCS has. So each of the DCS plant typically comes with a thermal storage where five degrees centigrade chilled water is stored in huge capacity, which can service the buildings for hours without even the chiller plants running. So which is a huge load relief for the distribution grid and all the chiller plants in a commercial complex or a residential colony, it could be several megawatts. And whenever during a supply demand imbalance or during peak hours, we could always request the DCS operator to give a load relief, which could be in several uh, megawatts. And the chilled water stored in the storage tank can still service the building. And another interesting fact is that our more and more electricity is going to be generated from solar energy and which solar energy is going to be generated during the day and most of the government offices other commercial centers all of them need air conditioning during the day so rene renewable energy can meet the cooling load in most of the office and commercial complexes uh, during the day uh, through dcs and this is going to be a very, very sustainable, economical, and win-win situation for electric utilities, infrastructure developers, and the citizens. And we advocate that this should be taken up seriously and made mandatory in all developing countries for all new buildings. Thank you very much. And you will hear more deep dive sessions on DCS in the coming uh, panel discussion and presentations. Thank you. We will now start with our first session, which is experiences with DCS projects. I would like to welcome Mr. Rajiv Sharma from Gift City to the uh, stage. Mr. Sharma is working as Vice President Engineering and Construction at Gujarat International Finance Tech City, which is an active infrastructure development company headquartered in Gandhinagar, Gujarat, India. Welcome, sir. Thank you. 
1.99.95, we are around 0.92 as of now, which we are very confident that we can come down to 0.85 IKW per ton. Now you can imagine running 140,000 tons with 0.88 IKW or by or around that area as compared to conventional uh, operational loads of about 0.98 or 0.99. It's a huge energy saving on the grid. Next, please. Uh, roughly once again, this slide earlier also we have discussed you know, we see the district cooling systems being more successful between 30,000 and 60,000 ton. Lower than 30,000 ton capacity, it doesn't give you full advantage of the economy of scale, whereas above 60,000, it becomes expensive because of the uh, piping loops and the pumping cost, and it doesn't remain that expensive. So we have planned each of our, each of our plant room around 50,000 tons around there. Please next. Now, I would like to quickly share a model for a greenfield hypothetical example this is, but it is near to the reality. So quickly coming here, let us consume, let us consider a plant size of 10,000 tons, which costs around 10, around 100 crores in India, 13 million so. If we consider a YOY cooling load increase of 20% and and with that increase, uh, with the startup capacity of around 1,000 tons or 1,500 tons, uh, Paul, we have to keep going back and forth with the next slide. Can you go to the next slide, please? So here, if we see, this will this is the graphical form of what the first slide would be. So we will keep going back and forth for a minute. So if we see that uh, the break even break even of the OPEX can be achieved in about five to six years. And the total break-even, the net break-even can be achieved in around six to seven years. As an example, I have taken 10,000 tons. And the part capex recovery can be achieved in around 10 to 12 years. Wherein in this case, I am considering that some of the capex is also recovered partly through another uh, vehicle, which is called a city development charge. Some capex is also covered, recovered there, and and some capex is recovered from the uh, from the tariff mode, where um, directly which comes in the bills. Uh, some of the capex also gets recovered from the connection side um, uh, that we charge on the first time connection that we give. The net profit starts to build up around thirteen years, twelve to thirteen years around that, and it continues to up to 25 years, which is the life cycle of a chiller, after which you have to start replacing the chiller. Profit is still continues even after the 25 years, because then you only replace the major components and you can continue to build up profit. And the tariff model that can be put in place is a fixed and a variable tariff model combination, which is used everywhere, including Dubai. Next, please. So here we see the graphical mode here. In about five to six years time, we have an OPEX break-even, and then the total break-even in another two years, and the part capex recovery in up to around 12 years. And then from then onwards, that's the profit. From 12 to 25 years, by the time you start beginning to change the chillers, that's all the profit is. Of course, with minor changes and replacements here and there. That's how we see a life cycle of a DCS plant. It can be 10,000 tons, it can be a larger capacity, but that's near to reality. And the need is that there should be 20% increase YOY in your load, that's a minimum. If there's a load demand more than that, you recover much faster on the CapEx and on your OPEX. And a slight addition in the 10th year of around 2.5 percent on the tariff charge. And that's the model which we believe is workable here in India. Next, please. We have also done a hypothetical on retrofit, which is called a brown uh, field model. In the same way, 10,000 ton, 100 crores, we consider 40 percent as an upfront load because the building and infrastructure is already ready to be loaded directly on the DCS system. In that case, 
two to three years could be our uh, working OPEX uh, break even, and the total in four to five years. CapEx recovery in this case could not be from the development charges. It has to be all through tariff and demand contracts. And the total CapEx recovery should come or may come in around 15 years time. And the net profit can be onwards 15 years again till the time the chiller requires replacement. This can be seen in the graphical form also in the next slide. Next slide, please. So this is uh, uh, this is a retrofit model where, as Mr. Pillay said, that the existing uh, cities also can be can be converted to DCS. So that's one of the models that we have tried to present. Um, that's our own thinking and has been supported by some facts and figures. But more true towards the uh, greenfield projects, but that's what we are sitting on here and talking about it. Next, please. So main key points that we consider in the green field is the technical feasibility and the right selection of uh, technologies. That's very important. And then availability of a space, uh, location of utilities and piping network is also very important because if we have a right location of the chiller plants, the smaller routes can be derived for pumping. And the pumping cost is a very important cost in DCS. Uh, preparing an overall plan and guidelines for DCS space is one. And cooling demand estimates is very, very important because if the demands are less than 20%, the system may get destabilized and can take more time to stabilize and the break events can, can deviate. Availability of power, water, these are ultimately important. A cheaper power is very, very important in the beginning of the DCS system when we are developing the DCS system. Uh, so PPA modeling, uh, solar supported energy, it all brings down your IKW, which is very important in the beginning year and can shorten the, it can shorten the, the break even point. Initial funding source is also one of the critical areas from where you get the funding and at what interest rate. And that's again, an important point. Tariff structure metering is there, which is very important. However, more important today we feel is the regulatory body requirement because that's what is going to take it forward at some point of time after four or five years, people will start to question about the tariff modeling as they become more intelligent and then they think that uh, the charges should be right or wrong or whatever. So regulatory body should, body should be formed internally or maybe government can help. And then the break-even points and return on investment and IRR are also important. Next, please. So on the policy side, I would just pick four points. Regulatory framework for tariff today, we feel in, in, this, in, in Gift City is becoming very essential. And we are working towards it uh, in, in a way to, to do some modeling uh, of the tariff uh, framework. Availability of power is still um, uh, uh, bothering us uh, because we, we are getting into now providing uh, district cooling to the residential building. And we receive power on the commercial rates and we deliver, uh, we are planning to deliver in a very short time of a year to residential buildings. And that's where there is a bottleneck. So uh, something needs to be done on this and we are working towards uh, solving this equation. And uh, we expect uh, for all newcomers, government should give the build tax exemption benefits to encourage connecting DCS to the residential buildings also, uh, without which it is not possible. I have read some case in Singapore and the government there supports DCS to be connected to residential. And the last, which is not least, is that DCS invest investors should be encouraged by the government for special benefits in power purchase agreements, uh, providing them support for establishing solar power, power plant and non-energy, non-conventional energy usage, so that the initial cost can be brought down. The IKW can be brought. Next, please. And thank you very much. And we welcome any suggestions in this case here. Thank you, everyone. Rajivji, there are two questions. Uh, one is you mentioned about a minimum uh, capacity of uh, DCS. What is the rationale behind this number which you had mentioned? It, it's, a it's a long research, sir, that we have realized in our projects when we were building this. So we have three plants 
uh, envisage 60,000 ton each. And uh, that's where the minimum uh, capacity, if you keep that less than 30,000 for larger, more than okay. 60,000. So that's another, you said uh, larger than 40,000? Larger than 60,000. Okay, larger than 60,000. So uh, another question is that what are the assumptions behind the uh, you uh, assumption for tariff saving for calculating returns? Uh, tariff savings means yeah. What what is the assumption of tariff for calculating the return? And how, how much charge now in uh, gift city? You can just mention that that number may be of also of interest to. <laughs> okay, so we have a tariff card. Currently, I do not have it. Otherwise, I can share it. Every all the customer get the tariff card. Our current price is seven rupees twenty pesa for TR hour. And besides that, there is a fixed cost. That fixed cost depends upon three slabs: zero to one thousand, one thousand to two thousand, two thousand to three thousand onwards. Okay, so turn off refrigeration TR capacity. Yeah? TR capacity. TR hour. Okay. So <clears throat> before I. Uh, more to uh, invite Pramit. I forgot to mention about the opening statement. Why India's market forum is interested in DCS? It's precisely because of the thermal storage. So in in Gip City, he has a thirty thousand ton uh, storage tank, thermal storage tank, and it which can support the uh, cooling requirement for a couple of hours. He can give a load relief of five six megawatt any time, any time of the day or night. The chiller plant can give a load relief. So that's a storage capacity which coming in. As the distributor renewable is scaling up across the grid, this kind of DCS with thermal storage is going to be a boon for uh, re renewable integration and grid stabilization. That is why we are looking at the systems. And uh, many of the commercial premises, maximum cooling load we need during the day. And with our increased portfolio of solar coming in, solar energy will be able to provide cooling load in most of the commercial properties during the day and even in residences. So uh, with that, uh, there are a couple of more questions. We'll come to that later. Let me go through the questions. Uh, I have the pleasure of inviting Pramit uh, Gupta for the, from Tabrit, who are the world leader in, uh, Tabrit is the world leader in DCS systems. And uh, yeah, uh, he's a business market development uh, uh, of cooling as a service model through commercial uh, scale district campus cooling systems for Tabriz in India. Prior to Tabriz, we had worked in private equity, specialized in real asset investment, etc. As said, over to you, Pramit. Sure, sure. Thank you, Deji, sir, for the introduction. Uh, may I share my screen? Please do. Sure. I hope my screen is uh, visible, Reggie, sir. Yes, yes, very much. Please sure. go ahead. So a lot of uh, uh, planning aspects and implementation aspects were already covered with, and some regulatory insights were covered by Rajiv, sir, earlier. I will, my presentation will mostly focus on how, and again, uh, how we covered one of a small campus uh, development projects in Hyderabad and CAC converted that augmented that with a district cooling system is what you know i'll cover in my presentation very briefly uh, before that we uh, as you mentioned sir we are a listed district cooling utility based out of uh, uae headquartered in abu dhabi we have currently 86 district cooling plants under our operations uh, small big medium all kinds of sizes we deliver year round 1.4 million tons of cooling to uh, top real estate uh, uh, across five GCC countries, which amounts to around 400 million square feet of area being air conditioned from our uh, district cooling plants. And sustainability, uh, as we know, uh, for air conditioning through district cooling is our, one of our main agendas. Just in the year 2020 alone, we negated to our district cooling plants compared to what would have been conventional cooling methods. We negated around 1.35 million tons of CO2 uh, in the environment and through efficient cooling, we also 
negated around or saved uh, uh, an energy efficiency of an, to the tune of 2.26 billion units in one calendar year in these five GCC countries. Right now, we are present in India. Uh, I'll cover what uh, concession that we uh, uh, won in India and how the district cooling shaped up for that concession as well. So, how to adopt district cooling in a master plan? We have to adopt a think systems thinking approach. We have to start from the very baseline master plan review and how to integrate uh, the district cooling infrastructure within the master plan. Currently, the construct of large campus or master plan development in India is to adopt conventional standalone cooling systems, which right now. Sorry, uh, my screen froze. Uh, I'm getting some annotation request, uh, Register, if you can see that on the screen. So request you to please uh, ignore that request. Maybe okay, some okay. of the participants must, must be trying. Sure, no problem. So if we can start with the baseline review, uh, fit to size DC uh, could be optimi optimal DC could be implemented in a, a district cooling plant as we saw that there are some minimum size requirements for a district cooling to be successfully implemented largely because cooling it's a utility it, it is a function of density that is getting served and the cost economics related to that business model is there are lots of business model one business model what which Rajiv sir mentioned there are various other forms of cooling as a business models adopted across Europe and Middle East, which could be, which could be uh, deployed for a district cooling, uh, a merchant district cooling or a campus district cooling model. And typically it works as a utility. So a developer, a cooling utility developer or the campus developer or the master plan developer themselves can <laughs> typically develop the end to end infrastructure and deliver a complete uh, cooling infrastructure solution, which could operate on a very long term basis. At least 30 to 40 years is what uh, can be expected, you know, to operate from the infrastructure that is deployed and with replacement done. It, it, the life of cooling can also be extended to the uh, too much longer around 50 to 60 years. That is how district cooling from a masters uh, from a systems thinking approach at a master plan level can be you know, drill down from uh, start right starting from the master planning stage. Uh, I'll just cover a very brief mixed use kind of a campus we were looking at in Hyderabad, where the total peak cooling demand was around 8000 refrigeration tons. And again, uh, this as as is typical with any developments, this is not something that all the developments will come at you know the same point of time there was a staggering development uh, uh, that we anticipated all various types of of all various types of end use developments coming across a period of two to three years so we had to be the district cooling plant that we were supposed to propose had to be modular to cater to the increasing uh, in increase in uh, increase in ramp up of the cooling demand over time so, so how the 8,000 tons, if not for district cooling in a traditional manner could have been approached, if the developer was going, you know, business as usual methods, the entire 7,900 or 8,000 tons of peak cooling load would have typically been met through uh, around 9,000 to 9,100 tons of installed cooling loads, which we can see is around 15 to 20% more than the required peak cooling load. This is what happens in central cooling systems where each building serves its own cooling needs and inadvertently due to the redundancy requirements, the, the, there happens to be some sort of overcapacity. And with this, the overall peak cooling load would have required say around seven megawatts of power demand only for cooling, a uh, large amount of space in each of the chiller basement which could have been used for parking or some other uh, otherwise use. And also the rooftop area could have been for in each building would have been occupied by cooling towers, which could also be could have been otherwise freed for garden terrace rooftop 
garden or you know solar uh, solar in the rooftop kinds of uh, models also what we proposed upon some brief review was we carved out all the cooling infrastructure for this master plan into a separate district cooling plan so instead of going for an installed capacity of 9000 tons to meet the 7900 peak demand a district cooling at a campus level with diversity the benefits of cooling diversity built in because it was a mixed use development can manage the entire peak cooling load is what we assessed from only an installed load of 6400 tons so again we see a reduction of around 20 to 25 percent in installed capacity compared compared to peak load and over 30 to 35 percent reduction in installed capacity from conventional method and this uh, overall, uh, the space required that would have been required in all the basements combined, the footprint of a district cool cooling plant would have been much lesser. And this district cooling plant, if a campus generally has a utility block for power backup or a transformer or some uh, grid connection or a substation, this district cooling plant can easily be clubbed with that. So there is no impact on FSI lost. But for a developer, uh, in, uh, this overall district cooling plant frees up useful area in the basement, which could end up giving flexibility in building design or usage of the, of the basement area for more parking revenues or certain other uses. And the most important feature of what we proposed in a district cooling plant was the usage of thermal energy storage. Uh, we assess there are time of day tariff differences where the nighttime power tariff in Hyderabad was around 15 to 20% lower than peak daytime tariff. So that was one of the aspects. And we could assess that we can further uh, reduce the total installed capacity. So we proposed a thermal energy storage tank of around uh, 6,000 RTH here, which at a four hour duration can meet a peak demand of around 1,500 tons and effectively shave off the power demand by 1.3 megawatt further down so which we can see that from around 7 megawatt requirement for a district cooling the overall peak to serve a larger aggregate uh, you know regional or a uh, master plan level, this could have significant benefits for the overall reason as such, uh, because of the capacity to significantly drive down power demand required for cooling purposes. So with this understanding of the district cooling, what we proposed, uh, uh, cooling of, of the understanding of cooling as a service business model is also important. So as a cooling, you, uh, so what Tabreed as a cooling utility does that we develop own central cooling plants and operate it over a long term concession. Uh, the entire investment technology management uh, selection design of the district cooling plant can get from a developer to a specialized utility player who knows how to manage the district cooling system and has experience in this. Uh, now, typically what happens in standalone buildings, it, other than open source access, it may be allowed in some Indian states and it not, not, may not be allowed in some, encouraged in some Indian states as of now. But once we aggregate all the power demand for cooling at a certain, uh, we can carve out that power demand from buildings to a separate district cooling plant. There is a huge, huge feasibility to augment various sources, energies, uh, either from grid or captive solar or waste hit or other non-conventional methods of energy to be augmented with the district cooling plant and provide the cooling required for the campus. Similarly, as cooling requires heat rejection, again, this can be augmented. This heat rejection can be augmented through effluent water or other non-conventional methods, which you know could involve if there is a nearby water body uh, that could be used and also geothermal wells could be used to uh, cater to heat rejection. So in all in all, compared to a conventional manner, a cooling as a service model through a district cooling plant could augment these 
extra sustainability benefits on power and water usage as well. Uh, on the operation side, because the entire plant is managed by your specialized utility provider uh, and because the system is very coherent, so there are huge economies of scale. The entire system could be digitalized like, you know, in a power discom uh, level. So demand management could be digitalized and the entire operations could be digitalized and much more efficiency than could be done at standalone conventional level could be brought in into an aggregated district cooling plant level. Uh, just some high level numbers we did uh, worked around basis the entire life cycle cooling cost as compared to this case uh, for a peak cooling demand of around 7,900 tons, what it would have meant for a standalone system versus a DC system. So we can see that on the consumption size, on the consumption, consumption side, there is a huge difference in tariff that could be achieved. Now tariff is a function of power efficiency and the water efficiency that uh, both the systems use. And the overall capital recovery is a function of how much a developer invests upfront to install systems to meet the same level of cooling demand, which could be done using a significantly lower installed demand at DC system. So over a 30 or 25 to 30 year period, what we uh, get the num numbers is that on a baseline without augmenting any solar or open access, the lower cost of open access, uh, the same grid power source can deliver a 20% life cycle cost savings over a 25 to 30 year lifespan. And if added, if there is a potential to add solar as well, this 20% life cycle cost savings goes up to 25%. But there is also a potential using thermal energy storage that the entire daytime peak demand could be met through solar as well. 100% green energy could be used to meet the daytime peak cooling demand and wherever there is a surge in, in in the afternoon time that could be met through the thermal energy storage tank and because of this the entire energy uh, index of the developments goes very higher because of so much of energy savings per square feet area of developed area so this gets additional green rating points for the buildings for the developers as well uh, these are some of the high level. I'm aware I'm short on time, so I'll try to wrap up very quickly. So some of the high level impacts of district cooling is reduction in power demand, freed up area in the basements for further revenue generation or flexible usage, uh, very efficient lifetime cooling costs. And the most important aspect is the reduction in installed capacity and the modularity attached to that. Uh, some of the other considerations could be, you know, if we save, if the overall end game boils down to energy efficiency, it directly results into a reduced carbon footprint uh, versus uh, conventional systems. The heat island effect, each of the systems can, from the campus, the heat island effect can be completely removed and brought down to a separate area. Uh, so again, the ambient temperatures within the campus can be, you know, brought down to a somewhat cooler level, maybe by at least 0.5 to 2 degrees Celsius. And nowadays there is a large discussion going on the refrigerant uses. So district cooling systems by virtue of large industrial scale uh, chiller usage can always deploy safe cooling and uh, uh, they, they can be very robust in phasing out HFC or uh, HCSC based refrigerant chillers compared to a conventional developer doing uh, it in a conventional manner. So this is my last slide. So one of the first PPP concessions, so we know Gift City is one of the first public uh, uh, DCS systems in the country, uh, but one of the other first kind of PPP concession in uh, DCS was planned in the uh, capital city of Andhra Pradesh, which was in Amravati. So it was a 20,000 ton planned system where Tabreed participated and uh, we won the tender to design, finance, develop, own and operate the entire district cooling system for the period of 32 years. And this was supposed to cover the entire Amravati government complex, uh, all the assembly, the executive buildings, the judiciary buildings and the secretarial towers as well. Uh, 
so this was the the district cooling scheme along with the networks was uh, estimated at around 375 crore rupees for the entire 20000 tons uh, plant so on the 20000 ton capacity there was use augmenting a uh, huge around 25% augmenting through thermal energy storage what we could achieve was 30 megawatt reduction in power demand with what could have been hap what could have happened in normal government buildings using uh, package dx systems or, or vrf systems using a, adopting a district cooling system could deliver this huge uh, savings in power demand and an annual efficient saving of around 20 million kwh annually so so this was uh, uh, planned and you know this is this project is currently on hold but as and when this comes up this could be the first ppp project for dcs in india off to you reji sir thank you so much parmeet sir for uh, the very detailed presentation we will now move forward uh, to the second session of the day which is the panel discussion on policy regulations and implementation challenges in district cooling systems and joining the panel we have mr rahul agnihotri coordinator district energy initiatives south asia united nations environment program with over 19 years of experience of working in energy sector, he is coordinating the District Energy in Cities initiative work in South Asia and supporting UNEP's new work on cold chain and e-mobility in India. Mr. Arijit Sen Gupta, Director, Bureau of Energy Efficiency, Ministry of Power, Government of India. Mr. Sen Gupta is responsible for international cooperation, demand side management, financing and energy efficiency initiatives, planning and statistics with coordinating with other ministries on technical matters. Mr. Girija Shankar, General Manager, Head CDP, Energy Efficiency Service Limited. He had worked as Regional Cluster Head of Southwest Cluster, covering ESL's operations in the states of Maharashtra, Goa, Kerala, and Karnataka, and has over 23 years of experience in energy efficiency and cleaner technologies. Mr. Marcus Viper, Principal Advisor GIZ, over 20 years of experience in project management, bilateral and multilateral development cooperation, policy advisory and strategic planning in telecommunications, energy, environment and climate change. Sir is responsible for the implementation of the Green Energy Corridor module within the Indo-German Energy Program and a project on energy efficiency and cooling. Moderating the session, we have Mr. Mikhail Jakobsen, Executive Director, Asia Pacific Urban Energy Association. Mr. Jakobsen has more than 15 years of experience within energy management and energy engineering with specialist knowledge in planning and smart RE integrated urban energy systems and hydraulic steady state and transient state and analysis of complex thermal energy systems. With that, I would like to welcome uh, all our panelists and our moderator and would like to hand over the stage to Mr. Mikkel. Welcome, sir, and over to you. Thank you very much. It is a great pleasure to have the honor to moderate this great panel discussion. We have, as you have got the introduction, uh, prominent participants with probably the most uh, the, the, the organizations and individuals in the front line of uh, trying to accelerate the development of district cooling in India in the panel. So far, we have got a great introduction uh, of both the importance of district cooling and the link between district cooling and the smart grids from uh, Mr. Reggie in the beginning. We also get some great real case uh, experiences and some uh, hypothetical cases uh, to see the benefits but also the potential pitfalls of developing district cooling schemes. Um, now we will move over to see a little bit more into the policy and regulation schemes of district cooling systems but also challenges in implementing district cooling schemes. So we have got a great introduction of all the panelists, but I would still like to go 
one by one again, where you could introduce a little bit what your organization and yourself is doing in regards to district cooling more specifically. So we'd like to start with Mr. Rahul from uh, UNEP. Yeah, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Uh, my name is Rahul Agniyadri. I work in climate and energy division of uh, UNEP uh, from New Delhi office. We are working in district energy uh, projects in India from last five years. Uh, there is a large program uh, which is focused on uh, implementing demonstration projects in district cooling and district heating in 15 countries, which is known as a District Energy in Cities Initiative. And as a part of this initiative, I am working in India and uh, closely uh, working with. Uh, Bureau of Energy Efficiency, ESL as a national coordinator for district cooling projects, uh, the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, and Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. We, uh, under this district uh, energy initiative, we are uh, doing several activities in India, uh, which uh, started with rapid assessment of five cities. Uh, then we narrowed down to three cities for doing pilot implementation. These includes uh, Rajkot, Amravati, and Thane. Uh, Rajkot uh, was a smart city project uh, and it was a greenfield project. Thane was a brownfield project and uh, uh, Amravati was uh, again a greenfield project. So these projects are at various stages of implementation. Uh, we supported municipal corporations in training and capacity building for district cooling. So the why part of district cooling now means why district cooling is required. So we think that it is pretty well addressed. Uh, now the part which is remaining to address is how, how we are going to implement the district cooling project. So some of that part, 50% of that part has also now been uh, addressed with uh, various initiatives that are being taken by different government agencies and uh, the private agencies like Tabri. So uh, all in all, uh, we are uh, looking forward to a very good market for district cooling in India. We have developed a district cooling potential assessment study along with ESL and C2E2, uh, the Denmark Technical University. And uh, under our district cooling initiative, we have around 45 uh, members associated with us. With their help, this district cooling potential assessment study has been prepared and it is available online for anyone who is interested to read and understand what is district cooling, what are the different policies and regulatory aspects, what are the technical solutions and uh, what are the barriers and how we are going to develop the business models and various aspects of district cooling today. So with this, I will end my introduction. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rahul. Uh, we, will, we will move over to Arijit from uh, Bureau of Energy Efficiency. Yeah, thank you, Michael, and uh, happy to be in the uh, another same panel uh, as we had uh, yesterday. So yeah, good to see you once again. So uh, yeah, myself, uh, Aridit Sengupta, and I am director uh, working in Bureau of Energy Efficiency, uh, which is the policy and regulatory authority of uh, for promoting the efficient use of energy and its conservation in the country. The Bureau of Energy Efficiency was uh, established in 2002 subsequent to the law that is the Energy Conservation Act, which was passed in Parliament in 2001. So that is, uh, so we have the mandate of kind of coming up with policies and regulations on behalf of the government of India on all matters related to energy efficiency. And uh, so basically a brief uh, introduction on what we are currently doing as far as the district cooling system is concerned. So India, the government of India has launched this India Cooling Action Plan in 2019. And uh, as per the India Cooling Action Plan, the building sector's uh, cooling demand is likely to grow very significantly by almost uh, around 11 times from the current consumption. And uh, in, even in the India Cooling Action Plan, it has been categorically mentioned to promote uh, initiatives like district cooling in India so as to reduce the cooling demand in the coming years and also kind of uh, leading India's uh, their clean energy goals. 
So with this background, uh, we have uh, started a project with GIZ, uh, wherein uh, we are uh, working with GIZ uh, to find out ways uh, to come up with some policies and regulations, and then also to come up with some sort of technical and economical solutions to reduce GHG emissions and uh, viable uh, business models for application of energy efficient district cooling systems in buildings. So with this uh, background, uh, I will stop here. And uh, of course, Marcus is also one of the panelists, and I hope that you will also give a detail on the, what the work, that kind of work we are doing. So I'll stop here. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much, Arijit. So we're moving forward to Kirja Shankar from EESL. Thank you, Marcus. I think uh, the greetings of the day for the, everyone and hope everyone is safe and well being at this time. So ESL, you may be aware that it is a joint venture under the Ministry of Power and it was created to create the market for energy efficient technologies. So ESL is uh, working in big way. Uh, if we say in part of the pooling, so as Arijit has mentioned that likely as per the ICAP, there are investors that 11 times of the cooling demand is likely to be increased by 2037 in the three decades. So if we see here, uh, what are the total uh, overall, uh, I think, ambit of the cooling. So primarily it is the room air conditioner in the India. So ESL is working uh, on room air conditioner. We have the super efficient air conditioning program where we are promoting room air conditioner of ICR 5.4 value. Apart from that, we also have uh, working on the DCS with the support of UNEP and the Bureau of Energy Efficiency. So ESL is a national coordinator for this in initiative. And we uh, uh, have created the project steering committee, which is the national uh, advising and steering uh, body for promotion of a DCS system in India. So with the support of the UNEP, uh, we have conducted uh, rapid assessment of the five cities. We are also associated with the pre feasibility study and we are also working with the OECC and uh, I think F2A and you are the part of that initiative. We have interacted many things uh, with our stakeholder and with your support and the UNEP support and the OECC support. So we are uh, in planning to carry out the uh, uh, awareness program among the different stakeholders. So uh, ESL has conducted uh, the market as assessment study and we have launched uh, in this year itself. That is a very, I think, uh, uh, broader document. It will provide the overall picture about the district pooling initiative in India. So what are the challenges? What may be the short term, medium term and long term initiatives we require? So ESL is working on, uh, on uh, the district cooling uh, in the big way. We are also uh, the one uh, uh, tri-generation company in-house uh, in itself in the ESL. And it is, uh, we also signed one MOU with the Tabrit. And we have uh, signed MOU with the two cities among these five cities. And we are working that, uh, uh, we can uh, collaborate with the different partners and uh, bring a few successful implementation of district cooling projects in India. With these, uh, I think, words, I'm just stopping from my side from here. We can deliberate in it. Over to you, Michael. Thank you very much, uh, Geja. It was a great uh, and thorough introduction there. We, we're moving forward to, to Marcus from uh, uh, GIZ. Thank you, Mikhail, and uh, yeah, thanks to ISGF and Apoea for inviting GIZ also in here. Uh, GIZ is the implementing agency of the government of Germany, and uh, we have uh, a long-standing uh, relationship with the government of India in the electricity sector, and in particular also with the Bureau of Energy Efficiency. And uh, henceforth, it was quite uh, logical for us to uh, look into district cooling uh, due to its very high potential. 
to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions uh, uh, in electricity generation by, by bringing down the uh, electricity demand for cooling. Uh, but uh, last but not least, also looking uh, into this cooling from the refrigerant perspective, as already mentioned also uh, by Tabrit, that uh, this is a very important issue. And uh, we uh, have always been under the mantra protocol, uh, being strong advocates to promote natural refrigerants, low GWP refrigerants wherever possible. And uh, district cooling also uh, provides an excellent opportunity to, to do that. So, uh, yeah, funded by our Ministry for the Environment, uh, this project uh, is to support the Bureau of Energy Efficiency in implementing the India Cooling Action Plan with regards to district cooling. Uh, so, we, we really would like to applaud India have being the first country to have uh, brought out a cooling action plan. And uh, that one is really very, very thorough. And uh, yeah, mentioning also district cooling as, as one of the technologies. And uh, therefore, yeah, we, we of course want to build on all the excellent work which has already been done by, by ESL, UNEP, uh, others. So we don't want to replicate anything. Uh, it's just that we, we, we want to also see how we can bring in uh, the knowledge from Germany and also with. Uh, the synergies which we might have with the other projects we have in the energy sector. For example, we are also right now having a larger program on distribution companies and uh, we see also distribution companies uh, perhaps as very important players in, in this, in the distribution of district cooling uh, because they as utilities uh, are very much used to provide cooling or to provide services. They may also be excellent uh, position to provide cooling as a service here. And uh, yeah, I think district cooling, as already mentioned also by uh, uh, Rajiv uh, from the city, uh, has the potential uh, to integrate other uh, technologies as well. Uh, storage, for example, as also mentioned by, by Rajiv Pillai. Uh, but then also waste heat, uh, renewables. Uh, so, so looking from that perspective, uh, I see really district cooling as a very, very important uh, building, building brick in the implementation of the cooling action plan. And yeah, in this project, we will see how we can best support the Bureau in this. We have in principle three outputs here. One is to support the Bureau in uh, coming up with a, let's say, district cooling code uh, that, of course, should be built on uh, thorough stakeholder consultations. We need a consensus amongst the stakeholders on that, and we need to have a 360 degree view to incorporate all this. So therefore, uh, we need to identify viable business models and, and make also sure that uh, the policies and regulations are supporting that and not become, let's say, suddenly a barrier for, for certain um, aspects of, of the business models. And uh, last but not least, we also would look into, uh, let's say, financing in the future. So how could we support the Bureau in uh, formulating, uh, let's say, uh, a, a plan to the development banks or the Green Climate Fund, for example, to bring in a larger financing scheme for this decoding. Of course, getting projects uh, bankable, that is a big issue. We also learned that yesterday from, from the ADB representative in, in the call. And we hope that we can also support in this, that, that we bring in more quality in the business planning uh, so that they can also get easier access to, to finance. I leave it at that. And I think we have more time in the uh, subsequent discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus. So I would like to start uh, addressing uh, Rahul from uh, UNEP in regards to the work you have done with the rapid assessments and, and this, all the different activities that you have been carrying out for years. So what are the major policy and the regulatory gaps that you have identified in your work? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Michael. So. During our work, we have got some learnings. Uh, and we would like to share those learnings. 
So on policy part, what we felt was district pooling is integrated in the urban planning and development aspect of the city. Uh, uh, maybe through bylaws uh, or through uh, the uh, master planning document, then it becomes easier uh, for the developers, uh, the real estate developers and the utilities to adopt district pooling uh, for the new or greenfield areas. So uh, this is one uh, barrier which I feel uh, needs to be addressed. Second one is uh, in, in a municipal corporation, uh, you need to have a district pooling cell. So if there is a dedicated cell uh, in the municipal corporation, they would be able to identify the different barriers. Uh, it could be policy, it could be regulatory, it could be uh, technical or commercial. And uh, they can quickly address these barriers uh, with their interventions. Uh, so uh, the, the regulatory barrier, like uh, the other earlier speaker mentioned, uh, if a district pooling developer is putting up a district pooling plan, he needs to have an open access uh, available for supply of power, uh, which will reduce down his power cost. He needs to have a power purchase agreement for solar power generation quickly so that uh, his IRR or returns uh, are increased. So uh, these kinds of uh, uh, regulatory barriers uh, needs to be addressed. Uh, also, from the tariff point of view, uh, since the district pooling uh, project uh, is advantageous from the peak load management for uh, any city or a utility. So uh, the demand response and peak load management benefits needs to be given to uh, the uh, developer of the district pooling project. So uh, the barriers uh, could be addressed by the regulatory companies. Which, yeah, so, can, somebody's microphone is on. Mr. Shovik, please mute yourself. Neha, please mute him. Done that, man. Apologies. Uh, please go ahead, uh, Rahul. Yeah. So, uh, Electricity Regulatory Commission has a big role to play uh, in this uh, addressing these barriers. Regarding the uh, level playing field for a district pooling uh, developer, we feel that a uh, lot of training and capacity building needs to be happened at different stages uh, in municipal corporations, in uh, the state uh, policy uh, and planning departments. At central level, uh, there are bigger organizations like CPWD and uh, NBCC, which are responsible for developing the government buildings and uh, government complexes. Uh, the industrial uh, development departments, which are uh, responsible for uh, developing a lot of industrial uh, uh, projects in different states. So uh, all these uh, people need to be brought together and uh, training and capacity building has to be done. Uh, MOEFCC can also play a good role in promoting district pooling. Say, for example, if they make uh, district pooling uh, as a part of EIA approval process for large township project or large industrial project, then maybe uh, the real estate developers and the industrial uh, projects can consider district pooling uh, when they're going for environmental clearance with MOEFCC. So that can also boost uh, the district pooling projects adoption in uh, different sectors. And what I feel is uh, in, in a city, uh, we only consider the commercial establishment, residential establishments. But I think the industrial establishments are also pretty much there in the cities. So we need to think about how the waste heat from industries, because there are textile industries, chemical industries, or pharma industries, where there is a lot of uh, waste heat generated. And there is also a requirement of pooling in most of these industries. So how these industries can also be brought under the purview and they can also be made as a part of the district cooling project 
can also, uh, can be uh, seen through policies and regulatory aspects as well. So with this, I think uh, I would like to stop. Thank you very much, Rahul. I think you're touching upon uh, some quite important things here when it comes to uh, waste, heat, and utilization of that uh, recovery. I mean, it's part of the energy symbiosis. I think also an aspect that, that could be considered is waste to cooling. It's very common with waste to heating uh, or combined heat and power and so on, in, not least in, in, in Europe and, and Central Asia and so on. Uh, but the fact of, of looking into ways to cooling, uh, hitting one, two birds with one stone, uh, take care of the waste management and at the same time provide uh, sustainable cooling. I think exactly these uh, topics are quite interesting when we look at integrated energy systems. Um, in regards to uh, policy uh, gaps and so on, I would like to uh, reach out to Arijit at Bureau of Energy Efficiency in you as a policymaker, uh, what is the priority uh, in terms of policies that you're working on right now uh, in regards to district cooling? Yeah, uh, so the policies uh, on which uh, we are uh, uh, working on with uh, under this project, of course, uh, number one is how to promote uh, cooling as a service. So we have seen that uh, other things like uh, be it uh, the pipe natural gas, has been quite successful uh, as a, has been quite successfully implemented in India as a service by other ministries. So similarly, we also would like to see how the local electricity utility can offer uh, cooling as a service as part of the non-regulated business uh, of, the, of, of their part. And at the same time, the second thing, which of course uh, that will come into the, uh, I mean, automatically will come into is how to come up with uh, viable business models. So whether it will be a wholly owned uh, public model or it will be a wholly owned private model or it will be a hybrid model wherein the public and the private uh, can come together and maybe all three can work. So uh, these are the two things which we are uh, trying to prioritize apart from the fact that we are also trying to come up with this district cooling code. So we are uh, I also have a rich experience in developing and uh, implementing uh, energy conservation building codes, be it for the uh, commercial buildings or for the residential buildings. So the Bureau of uh, Energy Efficiency has been into this domain uh, of developing codes, and I think a separate code for uh, district cooling would help uh, in that regard. So these are the few things which we have uh, prioritized. And uh, that's why we are also trying to kind of look at uh, various partners to demonstrate uh, this concept of district cooling in a few pilot projects and both for greenfield as well as well as for brownfield projects. We know that uh, it is uh, the DCS systems are uh, quite popular and quite uh, well working works well and it is viable in a greenfield projects. But at the same time, we would like to see what are the uh, things uh, that uh, are, uh, I mean, area of areas for DCS in the uh, brownfield project as well? So these are the couple of uh, things which we have prioritized. I would stop here, uh, looking in the interest of time. So yeah, over to you, Michael. Thank you very much, Sarit, for for that uh, thorough uh, presentation of, of the priorities. So. Uh, if we move over a little bit in regards to the implementation of these recooling systems, I would like to uh, address Girja from ESL. I mean, you're working as some kind of uh, coordinator with many different stakeholders here. You're, you're here from the cities uh, of the main challenges that they have and from all different kind of partners along the whole project value chain. So. Could, could you take us through a little bit of the challenges that you have faced, that you hear about and that you can anticipate? Thank you, Michael. Uh, so I, I just initiate, I think, with the, what Rahul has mentioned. So there may be regulatory push, may I uh, think propagate this mission for the implementation. So that's the one aspect. But certainly we require that there should be the market pool. 
So market pool may be in the, I can divide it in the broad three categories. One may be the technologies. I think the integration of the different type of pooling option of the technologies. So currently uh, in India, I think not so much uh, demonstration of such a big scale, uh, the pooling where we can have the storage, we, have, we, we can have the uh, solar uh, related uh, cooling options and we may also uh, see that opportunity exists for the utilization of wastage of the energy. So like the, in the clusters. So Ministry of MOMSME have their one scheme. If uh, a cluster approach uh, uh, related services can be envisaged, so they are providing up to the 50% of the total, total project cost or so, some incentive for the few demo, uh, demonstration projects. So for the uh, industrial cluster, it may be the IT cluster or where the commercial activities or the industry which are primarily the MSME, so they can provide the support. In the similar way, uh, we can see that there may be some uh, support from the financial uh, to address the financial barriers. So here we can see uh, at the Tabri, the other, other developers are working on it. So we can see which business model have provide opportunity where the private investment or the PPP investment, private public partnership engagement can be happen. So this is, uh, I think, uh, a second uh, 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 challenge as, as well as it require the addresses before uh, launching of uh, adoption of the large scale DCS uh, development. Uh, we have carried out under this city, uh, this uh, study with the UNEP. So there are uh, a very big potential where the implementation uh, of the DCS can happen. We have identified around 21 cities and based on the data of these 21 cities. So the commercial uh, space is around 30 million uh, uh, space where the air conditioning uh, requirement is likely to be happen. So we have done in the, both the top down approach and the bottom up approach. And if the conservative figure I can see, so it is around 4.5 million TR requirement can be addressed through, through the district cooling in these 21 cities, which are the uh, mostly the cities where the big uh, large scale uh, commercial space are likely to be created and residential colonies are to be uh, developed. So if I see this uh, 4.5 million TR, so uh, the investment potential are around 35 billion. It is the very big number and it provides a good opportunity for the uh, PPP model. These DCS can be developed and can be implemented. In terms of the avoided capacity, uh, the peak demand avoided capacity of the DISCOM, it will have very uh, uh, direct correlation because uh, most of the peak demand are from the cooling in India, particularly in the cities. So uh, if we are able to uh, have the multiple option, which are I think uh, one of the uniqueness of the DCS system. So these multiple option can provide a reduction in the peak avoidance. And this peak avoidance will provide the benefit, uh, the uh, I think leverage of the congestion uh, for the DISCOM. Also, DISCOM will be benefited that they may not require the extra infrastructure to provide uh, the demand uh, of the uh, commercial space and the residential space. In that case, the business model should address, I think, quantifying of these type of the benefits where uh, business model capture those benefits and provide some opportunity uh, to the PP developer. So uh, I think that uh, these are the key uh, challenges which are need to be addressed. And one of the biggest challenges I, uh, in my view, uh, because uh, I have worked the last, uh, I think two, three years on the DCS. So one of the biggest challenges there 
uh, awareness uh, and the benefits which may be available to the city administration. So particularly uh, as the Rahul has mentioned that uh, it should be incorporated some form of the bylaws or the codes that will provide a very uh, big boost and the regulatory push to this initiative. Second, uh, in India, we have uh, more, uh, many smart cities where large scale development is going on. So if we can integrate uh, this uh, DCS is one of the criteria for the performance of the uh, smart cities. That will also provide a big boost uh, to creation of the such projects. So it may be one of the indicator to assess the performance of the smart cities. Because the uh, multiple option of the cooling demand uh, from the multiple option of the cooling, that's, that is the need of power and it should be addressed. So with these words, I'm stopping here. It is over to Michael. Thank you very much, Geja, for that. Uh, so I would like to uh, give an open question. So anyone in the panel are free to, to answer. I'm, I'm taking a little bit from the chat here and tweaking the questions maybe a little bit. Uh, first of all, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there are some smart cities that has already included district cooling as a concept in their development. Uh, but the following question is, are there any urban master plans that has included district cooling in their development plans? Michael, I would like to take it. Sure, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, we are working with Rajport Municipal Corporation, uh, Rajport City, uh, wherein uh, the Rajport City has incorporated uh, district building into the smart city development and uh, uh, they have also made it mandatory for all the commercial establishments to compulsorily have uh, platinum rating for green building. So green building is mandatory and connecting to district cooling is mandatory. So uh, these are the three measures which have been taken to promote district building in Rajkot. Also, uh, when they are building up the uh, infrastructure for Smart City, they have incorporated the layout for piping and they have also awarded the tender for uh, installing the piping network for district cooling right at design stage, uh, along with the other piping network like uh, piping and water supply piping. So uh, these are some of the forward-looking measures that Rajput Municipal Corporation has taken for Smart City development. Uh, with regard to master planning, I haven't heard of any city incorporated district cooling in master planning. Uh, maybe uh, that speakers would like to add in, in that front. Thank so, you. Michael, uh, I have, I think, one uh, additional point uh, uh, in respect to the comments of the Rahul. So, it is uh, only the proactive can uh, adopt and uh, they can integrate such type of initiative. So if we target uh, the all smart cities, so certainly I can see that uh, within, uh, I think next uh, six months or so, we can bring some cities uh, where they can mandate. So mandating is not a uh, big, it is only the awareness and providing them the inputs that what the benefits the city will accrue if the DCS will be happen. So the awareness program is uh, one of the major thrust, it should be the one of the major thrust. Second, we should also uh, bring uh, the on the board some developers because if we just envis uh, provide the awareness, so there should be the some option that they are the some example or these are the some developer which can provide the help to bringing the project in a real sense. So we should uh, focus on the both from the regulatory push and uh, market push. Thank you very much. Do we have any other comments from the from the panel in regards to this topic? I I think uh, Michael in in the Middle East countries uh, there are perhaps some good examples uh, from the regulatory point of view. I think they have issued regulatory um, policies which uh, somehow make it 
mandatory that you have to check whether this decoding is actually technically and economically viable in, in a particular area. And, uh, therefore, if it is, then uh, that that should be prioritized. And I not, think this is something which is not percent uh, I uh, yeah, I think we, we cannot go much into detail. I just want to add one thing here also, which, which is important. At present, uh, environmental uh, costs are not factored in properly in, uh, let's say, electricity generation and uh, yeah, consumption. Therefore, this is something which hampers technologies like this to cooling and which makes it still let's say dependent on some subsidiary approaches but if and what we see now for example in europe uh, that more and more by higher uh, co2 pricing and mandatory uh, incorporation of that into the electricity prices technologies like district cooling uh, immediately become much more viable and uh, I think that's something which which needs to be considered that, that we need this kind of let's say top approach and then then the prospect for for such technologies will immediately look better. Michael, Michael. Yeah, please go ahead. No, I'm Rajiv and uh, just my two cents on, on this is you know we uh, we are here uh, in, in in gift city there are three segments one is commercial other is recreational and the third is the residential and by internal infrastructure guidelines nobody can use split units no one can for even a single split unit to be installed they have to submit in to submit an application to the planning department that comes to me and we go and visit why a unit is required except for server rooms no split ac so similar and the things are successfully working so for residential and all these a gift city can also be a role model thank you Thank you very much, uh, Rajiv, and great that you're shipping in. Please, if you have any other uh, comments on the previous discussion here, uh, please go ahead. Or if the panelists have any questions to, to Rajiv, but also Pramit Gupta from uh, Tabreed. Uh, if you want to ship in, please feel free to do so. So, my. Uh, Michael, uh, as uh, the Marcus has mentioned about the CO2, so currently in uh, India, this uh, we had uh, discussed with the OECC, or the uh, Center for, from the Ministry of Environment of Japan. So currently, uh, there is no bilateral trading on uh, uh, such arrangements. It may be uh, related to the Paris Agreement or so. But uh, the discussions are going on once the government of India and the other uh, countries will have the this type of engagement. Then certainly there may be a fund flow from the overseas and the, some other partners can provide carbon traded uh, related business opportunities in, uh, uh, in the DCS development. So that may be the one of aspect in the coming future where uh, once the government of India has uh, finalized those terms or what type of maybe the arrangement for the trading per se for this pooling space. Thank you very much for that uh, insight, uh, Girja. I Michael, think we, yeah. just one more thing. I, I just forgot ahead. to mention. Sorry. Yeah. It is very important to understand that, you know, if there are projects which are not commercially oriented and, and go directly connecting the residential unit, then getting the power from the city supply or a grid and then making a cooling, district cooling, and then sending the cooling to the residences, that's not one. So if there is a project which is not commercially leading, you cannot perhaps from my point of view do that can 
only do DCS for residential only, until unless government comes and pitches, pitch in and do some rebate on the electrical tenant. I hope I made my point. Yes, thank you, thank you. And I think also, I mean, it, it comes a little bit back to what Marcus mentioned before also. I think, it, I mean, it's not only to push for these kind of developments just for the sake, and bigger is not always better. Uh, I think the, the financial feasibility and bankability of projects are uh, of great importance, and, and not least the cooling demand density, and we should also, of course, not forget about reducing cooling demand, and uh, I mean, maybe increasing set points in, in uh, in the buildings and, and so on and so forth. I mean, there are many, many things to do uh, that are not directly related to the district cooling system as such, but, but still linked with it. And uh, also obviously passive uh, measures. And, and we heard before about um, of heat recovery and all these kind of uh, things. So yeah, definitely. I think it's a very good point, uh, Raja. So we are now running out of time. I would like to thank everyone in the panel for a great discussion. And I think the audience have enjoyed the discussion. I think it's clear that we have had a really prominent uh, speakers and panelists here today from uh, all of the important organizations pushing for district cooling in India. Um, I would like to, again, <laughs> link back to what Marcus said before. I think building on the great work in India is something we should always remember. I mean, there are a lot of lessons that are to learn from what is already done in India, and not least from uh, for the countries in the region, Southeast Asia and, and other parts here that can really learn a lot. And we know that there are a lot of uh, activities going on in regards to cooling action plans. Many are adopting similar uh, approaches as India has done. The, the, um, potential is great and there is a lot of work ahead of us and for sure there is uh, a lot of challenges as well ahead of us but uh, it's really great to see the momentum and the dedication of, of all uh, all the people here in the panel and also the speakers uh, before the panel so with that i would just like to say thank you to everyone and hand over for the final words from rina suri at the india smart grid forum uh, I will request all the speakers to switch on their camera. We will have a group photo. Uh, Parul, please take the picture. Yes, sir. Done. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So, Rina, over to you for the final words, as uh, Mikhail said. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, uh, to all our esteemed panelists and uh, for taking time out and uh, sharing your insights and experiences and the ex uh, excellent work uh, that you have done in this sector in promotion of uh, this particular sector and uh, for, uh, to Mikhail for wonderfully conducting uh, this uh, session and bringing out all the points uh, from the aspect of the policy maker, from the actual implementers and uh, from the utility and um, uh, you know, from uh, the implementer side. So I think we have been able to uh, cover a whole gamut of uh, all the uh, you know areas around the district cooling systems and we look forward with all the deliberations and uh, experiences we are trying to bring that we look forward to uh, some uh, good use cases and successful projects that can be implemented in India and uh, other places uh, uh, in the near future. And uh, we, we know that uh, you know this is uh, definitely uh, one of the pro one of the areas where which is going to support our uh, environment and uh, going forward uh, the uh, cooling uh, uh, the uh, uh, you know the heat that is generated through the air conditioning and all. So uh, we we understand that this is uh, definitely uh, the way forward. This is one of the efficient systems that we need to bring in. So we just have to see how and together we can make a create, create an ecosystem to be able to take it uh, forward. So with that, uh, thank you so much. And Mr. Pillar, would you like to add something here? Yeah, there is a last question from 
Terusha San from ADB asking why not discounts get involved in DCS business to create another revenue stream? Exactly, this is what we articulated in our white paper new revenue uh, uh, opportunities for uh, utilities, a white paper which we uh, published in November 2020. So, one of them is uh, district cooling systems. Not only that, we didn't stop it with that. Uh, we had presented this with a uh, session in distribution utility meet, which was chaired by the chairman of uh, Central Electricity Regulatory Commission, in which a couple of other regulators and utilities were there. And CRC chairman had said that a couple of these uh, uh, ideas which we propose, you, you should uh, try to do something uh, in, in 2021 in some utilities. So we have brought Tabrit and Tata Power together to explore the possibility of doing a DCS in Orissa, where they are, uh, Tata Power is now doing the uh, uh, electricity distribution or in Bombay or one of the other territory where Tata Power is doing. So it's the intricacies of that relationship. And, uh, CRC is very keen on taking some of those ideas, not just this one. More uh, ideas like that white paper which you can download from our uh, uh, from our web, web portal indiasmarket.org. There are about 17 different opportunities for new revenue streams for uh, particularly distribution utilities. So uh, there is a forum of Indian regulators. Their annual session is on 18th, this Friday. They have given us a 30 minute slot for ISGF to present the new revenue opportunities which we propose for. So we'll be doing that presentation on Friday and we hope that it will excite many regulators uh, to try and give at least a sandbox approach. I allow them to do, carry out some of them so that uh, permanent regulations can be drawn from that. With that, thank you very much. And, uh, stay safe. Look forward to seeing you for the next year's NCEF in Manila. Bye. Good thank evening. you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day. Please stay safe. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much.